Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today's video lecture will be on vector derivatives, or in particular, how vectors change in time. So the question is, why do we care about vector derivatives? I mean, why concern ourselves with how vectors change in time? Well, essentially, it's that the laws of mechanics, things like Newton's second law, some of the forces is mass times acceleration, is, is all about how quantities change in time. Remember, acceleration is the derivative of velocity, or the second derivative of position. So when I, when I look at that fundamental law, it basically relates the external forces to how something changes. That something, in this case, is the velocity, or, again, the second derivative of position. So the laws of mechanics are, are, are really describing change. And the quantities that we are interested in, in terms of the laws of mechanics, forces, and accelerations, velocities, and position are all vectors. So it makes sense that we need to understand how to describe changes in vectors. And of course, change is represented by derivatives. So when we look at a vector, vectors have magnitude and direction, so both of those quantities can change. If I just kind of represent a vector as, you know, sort of the word vector, then that is going to be a magnitude, which is a scalar quantity, times a direction. And of course, a direction is a vector that has unit length and specifies an orientation relative to some sort of basis set. So now, if I look at the derivative of a vector, well, we think about derivatives as d dt of the vector then we can use the product rule to write this as the derivative of the magnitude times the direction. And again, the direction is the vector that describes the orientation. And notice that the direction here is the same as the direction of the original vector, plus the magnitude times the derivative of the direction. So in particular, how the direction of the vector changes in time. So this first term is relatively straightforward. In particular, the magnitude is a scalar. And, and we understand how to take derivatives of scalars. We've, we've probably learned that in, in a calculus class that we've had. And this is the, the standard derivative that we've talked about before. The thing that's sort of new is the derivative of the direction. Directions are vectors, right? So how can we describe the change in a direction? And that's really what we'll be focusing on here. Now, to start off with, I'll give you two examples. One is straight line motion, and one is circular motion. And for these two examples, one of these two terms drops out. For straight line motion, so this is motion of the block that's only moving sort of in the horizontal direction. So let's identify two points. One is an origin fixed in the ground. The second point will be a point P fixed in the cart. Then we can define the position of P with respect to O as a vector from O to P. And we'll describe that as R of P with respect to O. Now the cart, again, is moving horizontally. So the velocity of the cart might be in this direction to the right. And we'll represent that as the velocity of p. So with this setup, the position vector can only change its magnitude. Right? It can never move up and down, right? because the cart is assumed to stay on the surface. So the direction of this vector remains constant which means that the second term drops out because the direction vector doesn't change. So here, r of p with respect to o changes magnitude, but not direction. So again, the direction of the position vector remains the same. We might say it's in the i direction. 
Now in contrast, let's look at a second example describing circular motion. So here maybe we have a car and now we're sort of looking from the top and let's identify a point on the car as point P again and then let's identify sort of the center of this circular curve as point O which means that the position vector from O to P is sort of in that direction. And again, this is R of P with respect to O. So notice that if the path is circular, then the length of this position vector never changes. So now the velocity of this cart would be tangent to the path. In this configuration, it might be in this direction. Right, so this would be the velocity of, the P, of P. And notice that as the car goes around this circular path, the position vector never changes its magnitude. Right, because the radius of this curve is constant. So the distance from O to P remains the same, which means the magnitude is constant. So here, if I look at how this vector changes, right, the magnitude remains constant, so this term is zero. And the velocity, which is certainly non-zero, right, this car can have a velocity as it goes around the path, is only due to the changing direction. Right, so in this example of circular motion, R of P with respect to O changes direction but not magnitude. So here we have two examples highlighting each of these two effects. Now of course in general position vectors can change both magnitude and direction. So we need to understand how to incorporate both of those two effects in a more general setting. But the change in magnitude we we know about, right? Magnitude is just a scalar quantity. Changes in scalars are simply derivatives like we've learned about uh, in our beginning calculus classes. So really what we need to focus on here is how do we calculate the change in direction. So what I have here are two sets of directions, i and j, and we'll assume that i and j are fixed in the plane of the paper or the screen. And then let's look at E1 and E2 that can move around relative to i and j. Right, so this E1, E2 frame can rotate with respect to i and j. Let E1 and E2 be oriented by an angle theta with respect to i and j. So here the angle between E1 and I will be theta, and likewise the angle between J and E2 will also be the angle theta. So we've already done some video lectures and some examples about how to relate these different sets of directions. Right, so I'll just go ahead and write down the relationship between E1 and I and J. In particular, E1 is cosine of theta in the I direction plus sine of theta in the j direction and E2 is minus sine of theta in the I direction plus cosine of theta in the j direction. If this is at all puzzling, maybe now is a good time to stop the, the video lecture and go back and review these change of bases. So again, E1 and E2 can vary as the angle theta changes. So changes in theta produce changes in the orientation of E1 and E2 with respect to uh, I and J.
Okay, so if I think about theta as a function of time, then I can pretty easily take the derivative of e1 and e2. So in particular, the derivative of e1 will be the derivative of this expression. So derivative cosine of theta in the i direction plus sine of theta in the j direction. Well, we'll use the chain rule and the product rule here to write this as the derivative of cosine of theta in the i direction plus cosine of theta times the derivative of the i direction then for the second term we have the derivative of sine theta with respect to time in the j direction plus sine of theta times the derivative of j. Now, if I look closely, i and j are fixed in the ground. So i and j don't change at all. Which means that the derivative of i with respect to time is equal to zero. And the derivative of j with respect to time is also equal to zero. So this is nice. This term drops out. This term drops out. Again, because these directions are both fixed in the ground. So now all we have to do is evaluate the change in cosine and the change in sine of theta. Well, here's where we use the, the chain rule because theta is assumed to be a function of time. So the derivative of cosine of theta with respect to time is the derivative of cosine with respect to theta. So that's minus sine of theta times the derivative of theta with respect to time. That's just d theta dt in the i direction. Likewise, when I look at this second term, we have derivative of sine with respect to theta, which is cosine, times, again, the derivative of theta with respect to time in the j direction. So here, I can write this as theta dot times minus sine i plus cosine of j, which, if I look closely, minus sine i plus cosine of j is simply e2. So what we found is that the change in e1 is theta dot times e2. And just a little notation, anytime I have the something with an over dot, that means a derivative with respect to time. Right? So here, for example, d theta dt is defined as theta dot. Right? It's just a little shorthand that we use. So the change in e1 is in the e2 direction. And then likewise, if I were to go through this procedure again, we would find that the change in e2 actually works out to be minus theta dot in the e1 direction. So notice in terms of these moving directions, the change in e1 is in e2. So the change in e2 is in the e1 direction. Now, granted, it's minus theta dot e1, but that's still the e1 direction. That's nice, but we can actually do this in, in a different way. If we're looking at the change in a vector, we can always go back to the definition of a derivative and look at how a derivative is, is really defined as some limit process. So now I have a vector e1 and I'm going to look at that vector it, at two different times. Again, e1 is a unit vector so the length never changes, only the orientation. So given this e1 and e2, 
let the angle between those two at the different times be defined as delta theta. So delta theta will be this nominally small angle. So this is the angle traversed by E1 during a time interval delta t. So between time t and t plus delta t, E1 changes its orientation by an angle of delta theta. So with this, we can identify the displacement of E1 as delta E1, right, as a function of time. And in particular, if I look at E1 at time t plus delta t, well, I can always express this vector in terms of the angle delta theta. By looking at, say, this right triangle, we find that E1 is equal to cosine of delta theta in the E1 direction plus sine of delta theta. Right, after all, this side is of length sine delta theta. This side has length cosine delta theta. And in this direction is going to be the E2 direction. Again, perpendicular to E1 at time t. So if I evaluate the displacement of E1 at time delta t, that, of course, is defined as E1 at t plus delta t minus E1 at time t. So this reduces to cosine of delta theta minus 1 in the E1 direction plus sine of delta theta in the E2 direction. And notice that both of these vectors, E1 and E2, are evaluated at the original time, not the final time. So therefore, looking at the derivative, and in particular the, the definition of the derivative, d d t of e1 is the limit as delta t goes to 0 of the displacement of e1 divided by delta t. So making use of this expression for the displacement We find that to be the limit, delta t goes to 0, of cosine delta theta minus 1 divided by delta t in the E1 direction plus sine of delta theta divided by delta t in the E2 direction. Now, we can express sine and cosine as polynomials in delta theta using a Taylor series. All right, so this is a little aside. Uh, cosine of delta theta is approximately 1 minus delta theta squared over 2 plus higher order terms, while sine of delta theta
is approximately delta theta. And again, this is a good approximation if delta theta, this angle, is small. So, doing that, what we find is that this reduces to the limit. Delta t goes to zero. So using this expression for cosine of delta theta in the numerator here, we actually come up with an expression that is proportional to delta theta squared divided by delta t. Well, if delta theta is small and delta t is small, then delta theta squared is much smaller than delta t. So that first term in the E1 direction goes away. And so the second term simply becomes delta theta divided by delta t in the E2 direction. Or theta dot in the E2 direction, right? Because the limit is delta t goes to zero of delta theta over delta t. It's just the derivative of theta, right? So again, that's theta dot. So once again, we've come up with the same expression that we had in on the previous slide. So this is identical to the previous result. But it doesn't rely on us, for example, writing E1 or E2 in terms of some other set of directions, i and j. And the really nice thing here is that we have shown that any So the really nice thing here is that we've shown for any direction, E1, the change in E1 is in a direction that's perpendicular to the original vector, right? So the change in E1 is in the E2 direction. So the change in a direction and remember here, direction vectors are, are unit vectors. So we're dealing with something that does not change its, its length. Right? But the change in this unit vector is always perpendicular to the direction itself. And that's a, that's a nice result. For example, here, if I have in light gray some set of directions fixed in, in inertial space, so this is I, maybe J, and then K is out of the board. And then I look at, again, E1 and E2. We would find that the change in E1 would be in this direction, which is the E2 direction, while the change in E2 might be in this direction. So now, we can generalize this by defining the angular velocity. And so we define the angular velocity of any frame of reference. So, for example, of E1 as omega, which is defined as theta dot k, where theta represents the angle between E1, or E2 in this case, and some fixed directions, some directions that are fixed in uh, the ground, so that theta dot is the angular speed while k in this case is the spin axis or the direction of the angular velocity and it's always perpendicular
to the instantaneous plane of motion for E1 and E2. Now, in this class, we are dealing with planar dynamics. So, it will, if the motion of an object lies in the planes, for example, the plane of the paper, then the spin axis is always perpendicular to the, that or out of the, the board, right, or the computer screen or the paper or whatever you're looking at here. So, with this, we can generalize the definition of these derivatives. So in particular, the derivative of E1, which we saw to be theta dot E2, can be defined as the angular velocity, theta dot, in the k direction, cross the original vector, E1. Right? or omega cross E1, because k cross E1 is E2. Likewise, the derivative of E2, which we saw previously was theta dot in the minus E1 direction, can be written as something very similar, namely theta dot k cross the direction itself, E2 because k cross E2 is minus E1. So now we have a single expression that will allow us to evaluate the change in any basis direction. If I know the angular velocity of the frame of reference, say E1, E2, k, then the change in E1 is omega cross E1, while the change in E2 is omega cross E2. And the change in any basis direction is omega cross that direction. Right, so this is a very general expression that we will use quite a bit in this class. And one of the things that it does for us is that it allows us now to think about how arbitrary vectors, not just unit vectors, not just basis directions, but really any vector changes with respect to the ground. Right, so here I have a moving frame of reference, B, so that's some, say, intermediate object. Right, and I will attach a set of directions, maybe E1 and E2, that are fixed in this object. And then I will identify a vector s as the position vector from a to p. And here, p is assumed to be fixed in this object as well. Now, if p moves around on this object, right, so this dashed line represents the path of p, then this vector is going to change. And it's going to change in a number of different ways. There's going to be a component of the change due to the motion of P in the object, right? So as P moves along this path. But then there's also going to be a change of this vector because the object itself is moving around, right? So if the object moves over here somewhere, right, this vector changes. So those two things are going to contribute to the overall change in this vector with respect to the ground. So, in terms of, say, E1 and E2, we will identify the components like so. So let S1 be the component of this vector in the E1 direction, and let S2 be the component of this vector in the E2 direction. So let S be equal to S1 in the E1 direction plus S2 in the E2 direction. And assume 
that we have the angular velocity of this object, or equivalently E1 and E2, in terms of the ground. So we'll assume that the angular velocity of this object, or this frame of reference, is known. So now, I would like to evaluate the change in S with respect to the ground. And remember, when we talked about derivatives, this indicates the frame of reference that we're evaluating the, the change in terms of. Right, so this is going to be the derivative of S1, E1, plus S2, E2. So all four of these quantities can change. S1 and S2 can change because this point is moving along this path. E1 and E2 can change because this object is moving with respect to the ground. But now, looking at the product rule, right, we will break this apart. It's the derivative of S1 in the E1 direction, plus S1 times the derivative of E1, so the change in E1, plus the change in E2, or S2, in the E2 direction, plus S2 times the derivative of E2. Right, so again, change in magnitude for this component, change in direction. Change in magnitude for this component, change in direction. So now I'm going to take these four terms, and I'm going to group them slightly differently. Right? In particular, I'll take the terms that only depend on the mag change in magnitude and group them together. Right? So that's going to be the derivative with respect to the ground of S1 in the E1 direction plus the derivative, again with respect to the ground, of S2 in the E2 direction plus now the remaining two terms, so that's S1 times the derivative with respect to the ground of E1 so that's the change in direction of E1, and S2 times this last term, which describes the change in direction E2. So now, if I do this, notice that these first two terms are derivatives of scalars. Right? So the, the, the frame of reference is, does not matter for derivatives of, of scalars. Right? So I'll rewrite that term, and I'll just leave that part off. So we have the derivative of S1, E1, plus the derivative of S2, E2. Now, these second two terms, well, these are derivatives of, of direction vectors. So we've already described those terms. This is S1 times the angular velocity of the body cross E1 plus S2 times the angular velocity of the body cross E2. Well, these two groups, this first term in brackets and the second term in brackets, they actually have a, they actually both have very nice interpretations. So, if you were an observer, say you're a bug, right? and you're standing on this object. So, because you're standing on the object, A looks fixed, and P is moving around. So, you would measure the velocity of P, or the change in this vector, as S1 dot in the E1 direction, right, just the change in that component, plus S2 dot in the E2 direction, the change in that component, which is what we have here. So, this first term, represents the derivative with respect to the body.
That's that first term, this whole term in, in the braces. While this second term can be simplified by factoring out the omega cross term from each piece, so we have omega of the body cross S1 E1 plus S2 E2. Well, that's nice because this term in parentheses is simply S. So ultimately, these two terms can be combined into the derivative of this vector with respect to the body. And so now we have a way of writing that. Right, so again, that is indicated by this superscript. So this is the change in S evaluated with respect to the body plus omega, the angular velocity of the body, cross S, the vector itself. So if I look at what we've learned here, the change in any vector with respect to the ground has a component that arises from the change in that vector with respect to some intermediate frame, or, or the body, B, and that's this term, plus a term that comes from the motion of the intermediate frame itself, right? So as this object moves around in space and has an angular velocity, that contributes this last term, omega cross S. So now, this is a very general expression that will allow us to evaluate how vectors change. So if I want to know how a position vector changes or how a velocity vector changes, I can always go back to this expression. And it's that the change in some vector with respect to ground is equal to the change in terms of an intermediate frame plus omega cross the vector itself. And we'll see some nice simplifications. For example, if S is fixed in this object, right, so if P is not moving with respect to the body, then the change in this vector is simply omega cross the vector itself. So uh, that's a really good description of how vectors change. And remember, the laws of mechanics are all about change. And the quantities that we're interested in are vector quantities. So this lecture will really set us up to go into some depth and to look at the laws of mechanics as applied to, to mechanical systems, which is really what we want to do in dynamics. So that's it for this. Um, thank you, and I will see you again. Take care.